Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Associate Professor David Wong. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for having me here and thank you for organizing this great conference. Um, and thank you for Dr. Aziz for the insightful talk. I'm Professor David Wong uh, from DePaul University. Let me share my slides here. Give me one second. Okay, so the topic I'm going to talk about is called the, the transforming accounting profession. So let me introduce myself a little bit more. Uh, so I got my PhD in management information systems from Purdue University in 2009. But interestingly, I'm also a certified public accountant. I'm a certified internal auditor. Uh, I'm currently the associate dean of the business school, and I'm also the director of the MS Audit and Advisory Services Program. Uh, so I mainly teach all the data analytics, data mining, all the IT related courses for accounting programs. Uh, I'm currently list on the Fulbright Specialist roster for developing uh, analytics curriculum for accounting programs. So I've been engaging the professionals for a long time. So I've been a, a speaker at universities and conferences uh, around the world. So for example, I do uh, give a talk uh, for conferences hosted by the Institute of Internal Auditors, uh, Institute of Management Accountants, ISACOP. Uh, before the pandemic, I was a panelist for the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank talking about cyber risk. Uh, that's part of my research. Um, earlier this year, I had a chance to do a 15-hour data mining training from McDonald's headquarters in Chicago. So I mainly do research in IT management and information security management. Um, and I'm currently an editor of the Journal of Information Systems published by the American Accounting Association. So I was the, the KPMG James Murray Professor in Residence. Um, so I had a chance to work with KPMG's audit innovation team in New York for 10 weeks. Uh, I have to know more than 15 joint project companies uh, we may be able to solve an existing internal audit objective. We may be able to explore uh, different possibilities or explore new opportunities for the company. So that's a little bit about my background. So we're going to talk about this kind of transforming accounting profession. So if you just quickly search, you can find a lot of different news articles and uh, reports talking about that how the information technology is changing the whole accounting practices, right? So if I just limit to audit, I, have, I can find a lot already. So for example, they say that oh, big data is going to give us a big opportunities, right? Um, we need to do this innovation in audit. We can have the analytics routes, the artificial intelligence routes. We can use the technology to bring new insights to the business. And there's a productivity webcast. Uh, I was involved in that one. So we can use the advanced analytics to actually move into to the continuous monitoring practices. So there are a lot of different things going on at the same time. But how does it work? What are the challenges and opportunities we're looking at? So let me provide a little bit background here. So we know that there are more than 40,000 searches are processed every second. So you can see that it's not just about the search, right? It's actually, we have 40,000 per second information searching, demand and supply, these matching processes going on every second. Okay, so that's the reason why we have all this evolution going on because we have so much information that we can start to search, we can start to share. YouTube videos. So how many videos have you watched today? Um, this is says that we have 4 million videos are viewed on YouTube every minute around the world, right? So if you think about this a little bit more, it's not just about the video. It's about the viewing behavior. It's about the comments, whether I like it, I don't like it. It's the paying membership, right? It's also about all the content providers uh, behind the scene, all the advertising payment schemes. So it's a lot of different activities behind this viewing behavior. We can also see that there are more than 156 million emails are sent every minute. So this involves a lot of probably spams, commercials, 
right? We, we do a lot of email conversations these days. It's globally, it's not just between the local community. And this email is actually connects a lot of different groups all together. So you can see that it's the exploration or it's the explosion of, of this data that can actually create all this momentum of this kind of big data evolution. But for companies, it's not just about those things, right? We have the traditional enterprise resource planning systems. We have the transactional level data. We know the sales, we have the inventory. Nowadays, we have the IoT type data. We have the sensors, we have the uh, internet of things in the factories everywhere, right? We have all the email communications that we can use to understand what's going on between us and the, and the customers. We have the audio data. For example, we have the customer uh, service center that we can collect all this information. We know the website browsing behavior. We know that you prefer this page, you go to these three pages, then you click on your shopping cart. We collect a lot of different external data, right? We rely on Google to provide us the analytics behind the website browsing behavior. We know that, for example, 40% of the users actually just click on our website and they leave in five seconds. We know that. We know there are 30,000 new users every month showing up in our website. We can definitely collect that information. We have a lot of social media posts, right? It's Twitter, it's Facebook, it's Instagram. There are a lot of different information, not just about us. It's about all kinds of communications, attention directions with a lot of different people. Data brokers. Uh, data brokers are actually those organizations collecting data behind the scene, right? So they know that our gender, our income level, they know, for example, whether someone is expecting a baby, they know that whether you want to buy a car, they want you they know that whether you are considering buying a new house. They don't know a lot. They know a lot of different things about us. So we have all this internal data and external data. So together, that's actually help us to get into this kind of big data evolution. But uh, let me quote uh, Dr. Gary King from Harvard here. So big data is not really about data. Say, wait, wait a minute. We just talk about all these kind of data sets, right? It's actually pretty exciting, but how come that the big data is not about data? So all this big data evolution is actually more about that we can now finally make sense of it. We now have the capability, we now have the skill, we now have the techniques to actually make sense of it, process it, right? For example, about 20 years ago, when I was an auditor, there's no way I can actually process 1 million transaction records. It's impossible at that time, right? But now 1 billion is actually pretty easy. I can run it on my personal desktop. So you can see that the whole evolution is not just about the data. It's also, also about the technology and the techniques we have, right? In the past, the data manipulation is mainly manual labor intensive, right? Um, so if you need to process the same data set collecting from data, different data points or different time points, you need to redo the whole thing again and again and again. But now, for example, I can show you that if I want to clean a specific data set, I need to go through 34 steps. Each time, the only thing I need to do is just click on it. It can click through everything, then I'm done, right? So we can do that in data manipulation really easily. We can do automation. Let me show you something my student did in my class. We want to do some uh, risk assessment here. So we collect the log file, we collect the uh, account information. Then we will be able to generate all the information we need based on the test. Then we can do the judgment and assessment almost immediately. You can see that how fast this can be done. We can do this repetitively almost every week or every month. There's no problem. The only thing we need to do is for assessment and judgment. We can save a huge amount of time in processing the information, right? And we can actually do something more fancier, right? We are now able to process the images. We can actually divide the whole image into these tiny pixels. Uh, you can see that it's in grayscale, but all together, when we put everything together, 
we can actually see what this picture is about, right? So we now even have this kind of image processing capabilities. By the way, this is developed by Amazon. They are using the Excel to show how we can process images, right? And there are a lot of no code or low code environment for us today. No code or low code means that in the past, when we try to do statistical analysis, we need to write a tiny program, sometimes a pretty long one, but well, we need to write something, right? No matter it's data, it's SAS, we need to do something. But nowadays we have all this no code or low code environment. That means we can just drag and drop. We can just click through all the parameters as we want to, and then hit run, it will give us the results, right? Some machine learning programs can actually pick the best one for you saying that, hey, we compared these 30 different things, this is the best one. And it tells you that these are the key features you should consider. So this actually makes everything much faster and much easier, right? It actually expedites the whole process about generating the information from raw data all the way to usable information. So that's why this is critical. But it's not just about the techniques, right? These are fancy, we love it. We are not able to do a lot of things nowadays, even with some basic trainings, right? But the key idea about this big data is not data. It's not just about, oh, we have these new techniques. It's also about that, hey, so what's the meaning of the information we just generated? Does it make sense? Let me give you an example. So if you look at this figure, it says that the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool correlates with films Nicolas Cage appeared in. So you look at it, wow, this correlation must be 70% or 80%, right? But this doesn't make sense at all. We basically grab data from the here and grab another data set from here, we put them together and boom, we have the results but the result does not make sense, right? So it's not just about the techniques, or it's not just about we can grab everything all together, but it's about that, does it make sense? Are we able to support the decision we need to make, right? So there must be an underlying question that we want to answer. There must be an underlying processes that we want to understand. Okay, so let me give you a couple uh, examples in the accounting context. I try to make the fonts really small so you cannot really see anything, uh, but that's the goal. I want you to focus on this trends of this graph. The line on the top here, uh, it's the sales. So it's the sales change from 2004 all the way to 2018. There are two lines at the bottom. This is about warranty expense and extended warranty. The question we are trying to address is that, hey, we see that this company is trying to do some estimation about their warranty liability and expenses. But does it make sense? We sell a lot of cars, but it seems that, hey, your warranty estimation does not really change. Do you really provide a lot of extended warranties? We don't know that, right? If I give you additional information saying that this company got a lot of complaints because of this car, should we change our estimation or not? So you can see that we now are able to generate all kinds of decision-making information really easily. But still, the key thing is about the judgment, the assessment after we are able to process it we need to somehow tie it to the business questions and the underlying processes we want to answer. The same thing, uh, this is an exercise we gave to our students. Uh, there are some complaints saying that for Illinois, um, the state where Chicago is, they say that, hey, the funding ratio of the pension is really bad compared to other states. Basically, it's always underfunded. So there are some problems with the policies and the protection of our uh, retirement people is problematic. Can we actually collect the data and actually verify that information? Yes, we can do that, right? 
So when we teach pension, we actually give them this information and say that, hey, can you generate this figure and tell us that whether that article is true or not? And you can see that in recent years, the funding ratio is only about 46%, but for all other states, it's about 73%. Yeah, so it's really bad, right? The pension here, there are some problems here. Or this one, right? Uh, so if I give this to our cost accounting students saying that the yellow, yeah, yellowish lines are the, are the fixed cost, the blue portion are the variable cost. We have the information from first quarter all the way to the fourth quarter. And you can see that black line is the sales revenue across quarters. So what kind of information you can get from this figure? The focus is on the impact of fixed cost. And this is something the airline company faced last year, right? They have a huge fixed cost. They can squeeze it a little bit and make it a little bit smaller, but that's what they can do. It's limited. They can also change their variable cost composition, but yeah, there's still a limit that about they can do in order to maintain the minimum operations. But the sales revenue drops like crazy from the first quarter to the second quarter because of the pandemic. So you can see that it's just a tiny figure, but it explains a lot about the underlying business and the underlying questions or the processes, right? Some students ask me that, hey, so how can we explain this? Do we actually able to see all these underlying business questions and the processes all the time? So let me give you a really simple example. So apologies, uh, it should be five kilometers in this context. So on the left hand side, if you drive into a big community, the road is super wide and super straight. There's a sign that says five kilometers per hour. Yeah, people won't probably see that sign because the road is super wide and it's really straight, right? So the community start to think about that. Hey, is there any way that we can actually force people to slow down? Even in the case, there's no sign that says five kilometers per hour. We can design the infrastructure like the one on the right hand side. We can make it really wavy. We can make it a little bit smaller. It's really narrower. So actually, when people see that, people will slow down automatically. But how does this relate it to accounting? So if you think about this carefully, the information or accounting people, we have imposed a lot of internal control mechanisms, a lot of incentive schemes, right? The data set we can see actually reflects the internal control mechanisms and the incentive schemes. So this is the same reason here, right? So when we change the controls, when we change the mechanisms, when we change the incentive schemes, it will be reflected in the data set. So we can definitely see what's going on within the company, what's the underlying processes we want to understand. But since we have a group of outstanding researchers in this conference, I want to pose some questions and raise some opportunities and challenges that we are all facing uh, these days uh, together. The first one, it's about the redesign of the curriculum. Uh, the AACSB A5 says that accounting programs need to develop skills and knowledge related to the integration of IT in accounting and business. But he also says that, hey, you need to consider your mission of the program, your mission of your university or your college. What's the ultimate goal of the curriculum or your program, right? We are not trying to generate data, data scientists. Now, this is still an accounting program. So if we think about this a little bit more, so it's not just about a one-time course or it's just a one course design. It's more like a reinforcement processes. This is just part of our program, right? It's definitely not just about programming, right? A learning one programming course does not really improve the skill set when they try to integrate everything together. We need to have multiple courses and try to guide our students uh, throughout the whole uh, curriculum or throughout the whole journey. There's a new CPA exam in the, in the US, which will start in uh, 2024. 
we started to see the suggested curriculum earlier this year, probably around the summertime. There are a lot of technically oriented topics, right? A lot of different suggested materials, but it's good and bad at the same time. The good thing is that, oh, our students will be more technology savvy. That's perfect, right? But does it really address the issue? What's the underlying thing that we want to teach? What is, what's the underlying concept, right? So it's not just about the technology, but how we can bring that into the accounting program and try to integrate them together. So about this, um, redesigning the curriculum when we try to incorporate information technology is a rewarding process because you can now see that we are trying to prepare our students for the future. That's good. But it's challenging, really challenging because we are trying to change a lot of different things at the same time, right? So uh, if we have some faculties who are trying to do the same thing, I encourage the department to provide them extra support and recognition just to help them a little bit more uh, to go through the process. And I also highly recommend that when there's a chance, please try to increase this collaboration between universities and organizations. We need to bring that actual business practices into our classrooms. We want our students to see that the ambiguity, the uncertainty the companies are facing when they go through the processes. On the other hand, our students will have a chance to interact with the companies. They may have a future employment ready at that point, right? Or we can actually do something for the organization. That would be excellent. Right. And then here's just one thing that I want to bring up for the attention here. Universities are competing with a lot of non-traditional content providers. Consulting firms, technology companies, they are providing a lot of free online materials. So we need to start to think about this. So what's the value that we can provide? It's definitely not just the diploma, right? Some universities provide a super excellent networking activities. But what's the value that may work for a specific university? So that's the question that we probably need to think a little bit more. We also encourage our, uh, our students to become a translator. So a translator is that our students are solid in accounting and business, right? So they know how to ask the right business questions. So if we are able to give them this some kind of technical and non-technical skills, they will be able to put them together. So it's not just about technology. They will be able to say that, oh, based on the business operations, we need to prioritize all these findings. This goes first, this goes second because of the limited resources. The training can also help them to collaborate with IT service teams. The team may be in the local environment. It may be in a totally different location. For example, uh, the IT service team may be in Dublin, the IT service team may be in Chicago, maybe in China, India, it can be everywhere, right? So it can be a global team that you need to be able to work with. But this is good because we now be able to provide more value added services. So it's not just about the checklist, it's about that our suggestions can actually help the company improve their efficiency and effectiveness. Of course, there are several changing technical and soft skill levels. Um, I'll skip the technical skills. Um, now we need a lot of different soft skills. Communication is one, judgment is one, assessment, global collaborations, all these are important. How to work in a data-driven environment with all this ambiguity and uncertainty. Uh, for accounting students, this is kind of a little bit weak. Um, we don't really like to make a decision in an ambiguous environment, right? Uh, in the intermediate accounting, we always have a single solution. We don't want them to throw us to a question saying that the CFO just had a concern. We just receive a complaint, right? Then we start need to figure out what's going on. But does it come with a change in this accounting and business knowledge? we actually see students have a broadened or wider career path 
we don't really focus on just on one thing, they now start to try to try different things. That would be excellent, right? How does all these technical skills, soft skills affect their job performance? Do we actually make them really more efficient, right? And more importantly, there's a digital transformation processes even for the accounting firms in this profession. Uh, Dr. Aziz talked about this people, process, and technology, so I'm not going to repeat that. But this is whole thing is all about this data-driven culture. Do we rely on data to make the decisions? Are we able to present something as an evidence when we try to make the point, right? But how does it affect existing processes? In the past, a lot of things are done manually, but when we change everything into a motor automated processes, how does it change existing processes? Does the new data-driven culture actually affect our new design processes? So there are a lot of questions that are still unknown or we are still learning, uh, but these are actually critical for this accounting profession. Quality of the results. Uh, in order to verify the results, we need to know that the input it has been verified. The Financial Reporting Council in the United Kingdom has already started to provide guidance on data quality issues. It's not just about data processing, it's also about the input data, the sources, how you collect everything, how you generate the results. But here I want to point out one thing, it's about biases and errors. The bias may come from the source, may come from our algorithm, may come from the person who is going to interpret the findings. So when we introduce something, are we actually introduce a new layer of biases? We need to think about it. The second thing is about the errors. We know that there are a lot of false positive, false negative. There are different errors we're talking about. If you're an auditor, if I tell you that, hey, based on this model, your decision, 85% is correct. There's a 15% chance that the whole thing is wrong. Are you still comfortable with making a decision based on that predictive models? Right? That's about your risk tolerance level, right? And is it just similar to, to the case when we human beings try to make the decision? Or are we actually collecting, introducing more errors to the processes? Okay. Um, so it actually lead to the discussion about this continuing monitoring processes. Are we able to find the key features so that we can actually focus on across time? It can save us a lot of time. It can also help us to focus on just on the exceptions. And there are a lot of external data sets. For example, Twitter can be used to uh, predict the cells. There's a wide range of different data types that we need to handle nowadays, right? And then we have been talking about emerging technologies can facilitate the processes. For example, we have been talking about uh, in the blockchain setting, we are able to give the information to different users, different trade partners, auditors, regulators, so we can share the information easily. But are we there yet? What's the impact of the whole information supply chain? These are all open questions that we want to address in the near future. So in summary, I have still have one minute. So we want to highlight that the advanced information technology has already changed the accounting profession. But the key is not just about the data. It's not just about the technology. The focus is about the connection between the questions we can answer, the analysis, all the way to the interpretations and the recommendations that we can make, right? So it's about this critical thinking skill set that we need to have and how we can communicate everything to the users. We have already seen a lot of benefits. Efficiency is already one. Some people told me that they can save 100 labor hours already easily, but there are so many different challenges and unanswered questions that require the collaboration between academia and the professionals uh, to solve all these challenges. But again, Together, we can definitely reshape the profession and bring more value in our future. Thank you so much. And thank you again for having me here and listening to the talk.